Welcome to the Spring 2022 Fellows Fest. We're excited to have you join us as we welcome this great cohort of fellows. My name is Emily Fisher, and I am a member of the Student Advisory Board for GU Politics as a Fellows Co-Chair. The Fellows Program is the flagship program of GU Politics and offers students a rare peek behind the curtain into the way DC actually works, brought to them by insiders actively in the arena of politics and media. As you hear from each of the fellows today, I encourage you to think about how you can get involved with geopolitics. We hope that you consider showing up to their weekly discussion groups, signing up for their one-on-one -on -one office hours, or applying to be on one of their student strategy teams. The student strategy team application is open through Sunday on the website and social media. Office hour slots are available now too. I can attest that this is truly a remarkable and rewarding experience that you will not live to regret. Now, to get us started, I would like to welcome the Executive Director of GU Politics, Mo Lathy. Hey, Emily. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, and more importantly, thanks for all of your leadership uh, on our Student Advisory Board. And uh, I remember when you first showed up on campus as a uh, first year student a couple of years back, um, and you've been such a fantastic participant ever since. So thank you. Hey, all. Um, welcome to our Meet the Fellows Fellows Fest for Spring 22. Um, I could not be more excited about this. Uh, the only way I could be more excited about it is if we were doing it in person on campus. Sadly, we can't do that this semester, but all of our fellows will be on campus um, starting the week of the 31st for their office hours and their discussion group soon thereafter. So you'll get a chance to sit down with them face to face. Uh, what we're gonna do today is um, I'm gonna introduce each of our six spring fellows, give them a chance to talk to you for a few minutes about who they are, why they're doing this fellowship and what their weekly discussion groups are gonna be about. And then over the course of the semester, you're gonna get a chance to attend those discussion groups, sit down with them one-on-one -on -one, um, and really engage in conversation with them. Part of our mission is to pull back the curtain. These are the people who are behind the curtain. These are the people who are gonna be your guides uh, to Washington and guides to the political process. So I encourage you all to get involved. After they are done, uh, each one of them does their little uh, uh, introduction. We're going to have a little bit of a chat about some key issues, but then we're going to open it up to all of you. Those of you that are in the Zoom, members of the Georgetown community, you'll see the little Q&A button at the bottom. You can start submitting your questions at any point during this program. Start populating it with your questions now. And then at about halfway through the program, I'm gonna stop talking to them and you'll get a chance to talk to them. Someone from the team will let you know when your question was selected. Uh, and at that point, um, we're gonna call you up on the screen so you can ask your question directly. So as we, as we like to say, make sure you are camera ready at that point. Um, and so without further ado, I am excited to welcome each of our Spring 22 GU Politics Fellows. And I'm going to introduce them uh, one at a time so that they each um, can really uh, talk with you. Uh, and I'm doing this in the order that they're showing up in my gallery screen. So uh, even the fellows don't know what order they're gonna be selected. First up, um, you know, we believe that journalism is a form of public service. And so every semester we try to bring uh, at least one or two journalists into this class. Daphna Linzer is uh, one of the premier journalists uh, out there who has a, a storied career working uh, for the Associated Press, working for the Washington Post, and then working most recently, um, or, uh, she just stepped down as the managing editor for politics at NBC News and MSNBC. She's no stranger to Georgetown campus. She, uh, for those of you that were around in 2019, was instrumental in helping us pull off the presidential candidate climate forum that we did in uh, partnership with MSNBC. Um, and more importantly to me, she's a very good friend. So uh, Daphna, welcome to GU Politics. 
Thank you so much. I'm really excited. Um, it's going to be a great semester. I'm so glad that um, shortly we'll be on campus with everyone, and uh, I'm very excited to, um, to get started. Um, as Mo said, I've spent uh, the last seven years uh, taking two networks through uh, the last uh, election cycles, which have been pretty big ones and important ones, um, and overseeing our coverage, um, our, our reporting and original reporting on the White House and uh, Capitol Hill and um, investigative politics, which has been really exciting. Um, my discussion group uh, this semester is going to focus on trust in government. Um, how is it eroding? How did we get here in recent years? And more importantly, what can we do to get it back? And I'm going to um, hopefully together with folks examine this uh, through multiple different ways, looking at our elections, national security, misinformation, even, even our, our healthcare policies um, and abilities to kind of um, manage this pandemic. And then also the relationship between government and the press and government and social media and how we um, got down this uh, misinformation highway and how to get off it. Um, so I hope you'll, you'll join us, um, me and all of my uh, fellow fellows. Thanks, Daphna. And tell everyone when your discussion groups are. Yes, please come. It's going to be uh, Thursdays, uh, 2 p.m. to 3.30. And for those of you that haven't attended them in the past, they are in the living room at the GU Politics offices and the basement of Healy. Uh, thanks, Daphna. Excited to have you. So, like, if you follow politics at all, you are conditioned to believe that Democrats and Republicans hate each other, right? I think most of y'all know that I'm a lifelong Democrat. I worked in Democratic politics for for a couple of decades. Um, but the dirty secret is we actually don't all hate each other. Um, many of us have friends who work on the other side, uh, like people who work on the other side and respect the hell out of people on the other side. There are very few people in this business I respect more than Kristen Soltis Anderson. I've known her for years. Kristen is one of the top Republican pollsters in the country. Um, she is an analyst on television, um, and I say analyst because I actually mean it, right? She's a partisan, but she doesn't bring her partisan spin to the conversation. She reads the numbers and she tells you what people think. She's also the author of a fantastic book called The Selfie Voter, which takes a look at uh, the millennial vote and what the Republican Party needs to do uh, to turn things around. Um, but Trying to get Kristen to campus for a long time. So thrilled we were able to make it happen this semester. Kristen, welcome. Thank you, Mo. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. I'm very excited to be able to join you all on campus this semester. Um, and I'm especially excited about the topic that I wanna be talking about during my discussion groups. So to give you a little bit of background on me, um, I came to Washington DC in the spring of 2005, shortly after George W. Bush had just been reelected. Um, I, I wanted to be a press secretary or a communications director, but it turned out I, I was okay at math. Spreadsheets and PowerPoints didn't phase me. And that turns out to be a pretty good recipe for being a pollster. Um, it was a job that I didn't know that much about beyond what I had seen on the West Wing or in the movie, The American President. Um, but I started off at a polling firm that summer, answering phones, updating spreadsheets. And since then I've learned the trade uh, and uh, seven and a half years ago started my own firm, Echelon Insights. So I've watched the polling world evolve a lot from uh, 2005, when we were doing things mostly on landline phones to today when polling has its own set of challenges. But my discussion group's not just going to be a discussion of polling and how it works, though there will be some of that as a part of the conversation. But really, I still think back to when my ambition was to do communications and press. And in a way, I think that a good pollster shares a lot of qualities with the press secretary that's doing a good job. A press secretary takes what their principal believes and expresses that view as best as and as clearly as they can. Um, and that's what my job as a pollster is to do, not for a particular principal, but for the American public. I'm supposed to look at data and say honestly what I think Americans are thinking. In a democracy, every two to four years we have, or if you're in the Senate, six, uh, you are up for re-election and that's when people get to make their voice heard. 
But polls are an interesting way that people can make their voice heard in the interim. So my discussion group is about polling, polarization, and listening in politics. And we're going to talk to folks about, you know, what are the ways that, say, a member of Congress might take in polls or what they're hearing in social media chatter or what they're hearing at a town hall or what they hear from lobbyists. How do they take all of those inputs and think them through clearly as they're making decisions about how to govern? How can we do better jobs of listening to one another so that we, rather than assuming the worst about the other side, is there a way that data can help us have a clearer picture of what the other side believes? So my, my discussion group is going to be Wednesdays from 4 to 530 um, and if you're lucky, you might get to have, uh, uh, might get a visit from my co-professor, my golden retriever, Wally. If you follow Kristen on Twitter, you have already gotten to know Wally very, very well. Kristen, so excited to have you. Thanks. Um, so right after the Obama administration ended, a dear personal friend of mine who worked at the Department of Justice shot me a note and said, hey, I know this guy. Um, who uh, a colleague of mine at DOJ, uh, who I think you like, you just like, and wondering if you'd grab coffee with him. And I did. And he was right. I really liked this guy. I had a great conversation. And then, you know, fast forward a couple of months and I'm sitting in my office and I look up at my TV screen and there's Elliot Williams on CNN as a legal analyst, um, engaging and insightful uh, and really helping people understand the nexus of law and politics. Uh, Elliot's worked across all branches of government, I mean, clerked for federal judges, having worked a couple of stints at DOJ, having served as a political appointee. Um, the guy really knows this town and that intersection of law and politics. Elliot, welcome to Georgetown. Well, thanks uh, so much for having me, Mo. And and along those lines, um, so I worked in government, uh, as I told the other fellows earlier today, uh, for 15 years, but had the experience of being number one, uh, both a political appointee and a career sort of public servant, right? I, I was a prosecutor at the Justice Department, um, but also having worked in all three branches of government. Like you said, I worked for, for two judges. I worked for then Senator Schumer when he was on the Judiciary Committee. Um, and then um, uh, in the Obama administration at both the Department of Homeland Security, I was at ICE for the first four years as a political appointee, and then back at the Justice Department. And you know now my two roles are number one, um, being the legal analyst on CNN that you mentioned, and also at a um, consulting firm called the Rabin Group right now, where uh, which is sort of my day job. My so all of this said, my something that I found the more I talk about the law on television or in writing or on radio or whatever, is that there are legal issues. And there are political issues, but increasingly they get sort of smushed into one. And we've seen it more and more over the last several years. Uh, you know, there are many, many causes of that. And it all starts from the premise that we believe that the law is itself a political. Once things are written on paper, once the, once the laws are drafted, theoretically they exist outside of politics, but that's just not the case. And I was telling uh, the other fellows just this morning, something I said, a, fa a legally factual statement that I made uh, on CNN this morning, a, a bunch of people from the left sort of came at me about it and said, well, how can you say that? Well, because it's true. Right. So what I did with my discussion group was break down eight different stories that we've been talking about over the last several years. January 6th, impeachment, um, the Derek Chauvin trial, um, also Kyle Rittenhouse, which I think I'm going to add. And how do how do we talk about and think about legal issues in a political context? And where do we have to give up the fiction that law is itself a political or just double down and just accept that um, accept that, that it might not be. So um, it's a discussion of, of those issues. Um, and a lot of this, quite frankly, stems from the four years of Donald Trump as president, where and I don't say that as, as a partisan point, but impeachment is itself both a legal and political matter where partisan players on both sides have to be players in, in a legal process. So needless to say, um, lots to discuss there. Uh, and I look forward to meeting everybody and talking through some of them. Thanks, Elliot. Um, so I don't think it would be 
a partisan thing to say that the Trump administration was full of a lot of interesting characters. Um, but one of the people I actually find the most interesting um, is our next fellow, Alyssa Farah. Um, Alyssa has had a very fascinating career trajectory, kind of being along for the ride throughout the, the, the Tea Party and then MAGA movement, having served as spokeswoman for the House Freedom Caucus, going into uh, the Trump administration first as press secretary to the vice president, and then spokesperson for the Pentagon, and then the final uh, communications director for the president. She resigned uh, in December of 2020 um, and became a, a fairly critical voice uh, in the wake of January 6th um, and is working uh, and helping and assisting the, uh, the select committee uh, uh, investigating what happened in January 6th. She's also now a CNN analyst, political analyst, um, Alyssa, welcome to Georgetown. Thank you, Mo. I cannot even express how thrilled I am to be here. I can't imagine a more exciting class to be with. Um, all of the fellows you guys are going to meet tonight are people I've just respected and thought the world of for so long. Um, but I will say this, it's kind of starting backward with me, and, and Mo leaned into this. Um, you don't get much closer to conservative politics and sort of the rise of the Tea Party movement, which led to the MAGA movement than myself. Um, you know, I worked for Mark Meadows when he was a no-name backbench freshman lawmaker. I went on to be the first spokeswoman for the House Freedom Caucus, then went on to work for Vice President Mike Pence, then into the Department of Defense, and finally to the White House under President Trump. I had a very interesting career arc in Republican politics in the sense that I'm as conservative as I've ever been, but I've also witnessed my party change, and I've witnessed the direction that the party's going, challenging the very institutions that I, as a conservative, hold extremely dear. What I am going to attempt to tackle this semester with the help of those of you who attend and with the students who are going to help me out is my, my discussion group is called the Future of Democracy and the MAGA Movement. Um, January 6th changed the way that I, I see our country and its trajectory going forward. Um, when I worked for the vice president, when I worked at the Department of Defense, I traveled to more than two or three dozen countries as part of an official U.S. delegation. Democracy is much more fragile than our own. And to see our institutions be pushed to the brink because partisanship and hyper-partisanship had run so rampant and because disinformation was spread so wildly is something that we have to tackle. So my discussion group is going to be partially how did we get here, taking a lot of responsibility about what conservatives like myself did wrong and led to this moment, but then also where I'm going to turn to you and hopefully myself be able to offer some, some critical ideas is what, what do we do next? Where do we go from here? So I'm thrilled to tackle this. It's a very tough subject, but it's one that we can't put off discussing. And I look forward to meeting you all in person. Thanks, Alyssa. And remind everyone, when is your group? My study group is Tuesdays uh, from 4 p.m. to 5.30. and look forward to seeing you guys there. Thanks, Alyssa. So our next fellow... Um, is someone I have watched in her career for quite some time, uh, has impressed me for a long time, and is uh, has a very distinct uh, place in political operative history. She is the only person who has served as the top spokesperson and communication strategist to the two highest ranking women ever to serve in American government. Ashley Etienne uh, recently stepped down as communications director to Vice President Harris. She also held a similar role and senior advisor to Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Those are two pretty cool things. She's done a lot of other cool things, having worked in the Obama White House and uh, been in democratic politics for a long time. Uh, Ashley, so excited to uh, welcome you to this class. Thank you, Mo. I'm super excited to join this class of stellar, exceptional political types, um, journalists, a whole array of people that I'm very excited to um, to join and, and really engage. So as you said, I mean, I've had this incredible career. I arrived in Washington with no relationships, just as a young person with a burning desire to make a mark on the place and on the business. And I can say after 20 years of serving as a political strategist, specializing in communications, 
I've done that, just to humbly say. Uh, as you mentioned, I worked you know, to the, the very top ends of Pennsylvania Avenue, serving as a senior advisor to, I would say, our, our nation's most transformative political figures from Obama to Pelosi to Harris. It's just been an incredible ride. I've really been at the center of all the action. I'm the type that likes to run to the burning fire. And so I've, <laughs> I've run to a lot of burning fires and put a lot out. You know, I'm proud to say that I helped elect the first black president. We flipped Virginia, led the team to won the house back and elected Speaker Pelosi as a as a speaker a second time. And then, you know, capping off my political experience on the Hill, aside from going back to the White House a second time, was leading the war room to impeach President Trump, which was a historic effort. So that was um, so that's been an incredible ride. And I'd like to and I'm excited about taking all that I've learned and all of those experience to bring it to um, the students here at Georgetown and really examine the politics of power. My old boss used to always say to me all the time, like, you gotta know your power, Ashley, power isn't given, you gotta go in and you gotta take it, and you gotta fight for it. And I was always like, what does that actually mean? So that's what we'll examine, like what, how is power actually defined? And then how is it leveraged and strategically deployed to, you know, from everything from changing the fate of our nation to disrupting the status quo, to helping real people, voters across the country, actualize their will. So um, as I mentioned, you know, I've had a first front row seat to seeing my former bosses negotiate the politics of power, confronts uh, sexism, racism, ageism as being the first. And now I want to sort of take that and broaden it out and to look at others in the political arena and various industries and how they're exercising and utilizing their powers from disruptors like the Tea Party to Little Nas X and how voters who swung the 2020 election are now using their power or lack thereof to hold the White House accountable on everything from debt forgiveness to the George Floyd Justice and Policing Bill. So we'll explore the efficacy of their approaches and really try to define what are the lessons learned um, about how people can utilize their power to gain political, economic, and individual power, but also to use it as a source of inspiration for the students here at Georgetown who want to figure out, like as I was as a young person on Capitol Hill, what is my power and then how do I utilize it to affect the world around me? So that's what we'll be doing and I'm excited about it and hope you'll join me. And when can they join you? So it's Wednesdays um, from 2 to 3.30. I packed wonderful conversations. So looking forward to it. Awesome. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you. Um, last but not least, um, you know, as I started the conversation, journalists are, uh, I think, some of the most underrated um, public servants there are. Uh, our next fellow is not underrated. He is well recognized and well respected and um, for good reason. Um, He's a storyteller in a way that I think is incredibly impactful and powerful, helping not just report what is happening, but people helping people understand why it's happening and helping people understand who it's happening to. Uh, Wesley Lowry um, has really is, uh, is with CBS. He has been at the Washington Post um, and um, uh, is just one of the top reporters, I believe, in the country really um, diving into some of the most difficult and challenging stories of our time. If there's a, a story about racial unrest or conflict between a community and the police, don't be surprised if Wes is there on the ground talking to the people who are impacted by that story, um, whether it's in Ferguson or Minneapolis or wherever, and that work has earned him the Pulitzer Prize. Um, Wesley, I can't tell you what an honor it is to welcome you to this class. Of course. Well, Mo, thank you for having me. As you guys can see, I am on a train currently, and so I'm going to be a little brief so I can get my mask back on in a little bit. Um, but I'm really excited to join you all. Um, as Mo alluded to, um, I'm a journalist who primarily covers issues of race and justice, um, but primarily or, or previously have covered politics at both the local and national level and still very often write about the spaces where issues of justice and race and equity and inclusion in our politics and the system. Um, and so I, I'm really excited, you know, having done uh, one, just to talk with you all and get to know you through our discussion groups. 
Um, my discussion group is going to be about the media in this moment, um, having worked um, in the media in various different capacities, whether it be at places like the Washington Post or Los Angeles Times, the Wall Street Journal, or more recently, places like GQ Magazine or CBS in 60 Minutes, having worked on camera, having worked behind the camera, having worked as a writer, having done audio. I think there's a lot of great conversation to be had in this moment about the institution of our media. Uh, we know that uh, much like all the rest of our institutions, trust among the public is plummeted in our media. Um, and there are many reasons for that. Some of that is due to the economic realities, um, the resources that are available and are not. Some of it's due to the intense partisanship of our moment. Uh, some of it is due in part because of that partisanship to um, active campaigns to discredit the institution of our media. Um, because if you don't like what's being reported, it's a lot easier to tell people not to believe it than to grapple with the reality of what's being reported. Uh, but I'm really interested in talking with you all about, uh, one, how we got to this point, two, perhaps how we build uh, something that looks different. Uh, we know that a free press is vital to our democracy. Um, having a shared set of understanding and facts help us have the dialogue and the hard conversations that we need to have um, in a democracy and in a free society. Um, and so that is going to be kind of the focus of the conversations and my discussion group. Uh, it's going to meet on Thursdays from 4 to uh, 5.30 p.m. Awesome. Thank you, Wesley. Thank you. Um, so listen, uh, you guys now have a sense uh, as to why we selected these people to be fellows um, and why we're excited for their discussions. So look, I'm just going to throw a question out to the group and would love your take on this. Today is the one year anniversary of the Biden-Harris administration. The president campaigned very aggressively on uh, the idea that we need to unify the country and that he would help unify the country. Um, you know, and yesterday in his press conference, he got asked by a reporter like, are you doing on that? Um, but I'm less interested in your thoughts, feel free to weigh in, on how he's doing on unifying the country. But just your thoughts on the general issue of unity, what it means and why it feel, why we're so polarized right now, or are we less polarized than everyone makes us out to be? So just sort of a general, your general thoughts on like where we're at as, as a people and, and um, uh, and and the polarization that seems to divide us. So Mo, wanna, I can, I'll yeah, I'll, I'll jump in first. Good. I'll I'll set the scene from a polling perspective. So, look, I think that li if you live in a democracy, disagreement is not a bad thing. Um, and there's a lot of research that shows that even if you have a public that's very divided on big questions, that's okay. Um, it's it's fine for us to all not agree on everything. Um, as long as the disagreement is productive. And the thing that's most challenging right now in American politics is it's not that it's not ideological polarization. It's not that conservatives are all way, way, way over on the right and liberals are all way, way over on the left and no one's in the middle. There are lots of Americans in the middle who hold, you know, heterodox views. They take a little of column A and a little of column B and it's great. The problem is Affective polarization is the technical term for it, which basically means how much do you dislike the other side at a personal level compared to your own? So the problem isn't that we disagree with one another in big ways on things like debt or spending or what the role of government should be or culture or what have you. The problem is that increasingly we view the other side not just as wrong, but as a grave threat. And the people on the other side, we don't just view them as wrong, but we view them through a very negative kind of personal animosity type lens. And that's what makes me so concerned because it's not just if you bring people together to talk about issues, they'll all agree. But if it's at this more personal level, that's what, why I think it is so important for leaders to step up um, and to try to create an environment where that's not encouraged because Again, it's not just about people disagreeing on ideas, which would be fine in a democracy. It's people disagreeing over uh, whether they can even like each other or live with each other. I mean, Ashley and Alyssa, I'd be curious in your takes on this, um, having worked for the last two, you know, the current and the previous administrations, right? It seems to me that a lot of people 
who work in politics, that there's this big tension about how much we should be reaching across the aisle versus, you know, how much we should take care of our own, right? Like we got the votes, we should flex our muscle now. And, you know, elections have consequences, as President Obama used to famously say, right? Like this notion of, of the importance of, of finding common ground. I'll jump in because I think Ashley's going to have a strong rebuttal to me. <laughs> um, I'll say this. I think Joe Biden's greatest strength is his humanity and his ability to connect with people on an on a personal level that makes him seem like just genuinely a nice guy. So this kind of came across yesterday when he did this marathon press conference. He got comfortable with it. He wanted to be talking to people. He said, you know, he wanted to be back out in the black community meeting with people one on one. However, the challenge that Biden's running into, which any politician is going to, is he's coming up on a midterm cycle and then he's coming up on a reelection. So he's getting pulled to the direction of what his base wants, which is what I think led to what was very divisive rhetoric when talking about voting rights last week. I, I made this point on CNN. I think that there are absolutely a dozen good faith Republican senators who would be willing to work around the margins of the, the major bill that he's trying to pass. But instead, he jumped to what would have been more of a play to the base of criticizing and demonizing. It's not Joe Biden's natural place to be, though. That, that isn't his from everything I've observed in his, you know, 40 plus years. I've not observed him that long in politics. His natural place of being is he wants to get along with people and he wants to see the humanity on the other side. So, I mean, if I were advising him from a legacy perspective, I would say lean into Joe Biden that's friends with people on the other side of the aisle, that's talking to members of the Senate, that's trying to leave this legacy of rebuilding after the division of Trump. But of course, if I were advising him politically in terms of 2022 and 2024, then yes, you play to the base. And I think that's what they're kind of grappling with right now. Mo, I think what I've seen is a little bit of what Kristen said, which is the politics of the personal, really. I, I mean, that really started to become very apparent around the time I was doing the Fast and Furious investigation. And that sort of all, it was less about the facts on the table, but it was more about Eric Holder, for example, or um, George George Bush, whoever, you know, the former president. So, I, I mean, I, I see it like for me, I think there's these outside forces that are at play that we have, we as a, as a society have to figure out how to address these things, which is one for me is like not being able to stipulate to the facts, right? I mean, there are people who still dispute whether or not January 6th actually even happened, people who were in the building. And for me, I think that is in, in terms of whether or not we can coalesce around an agenda as a, as a nation, whether or not we can work in a bipartisan fashion to advance legislation that, that's in the interest of our own competitiveness as a nation, really gets to this issue of whether or not we can stipulate to a set of facts. It also bleeds into our relationships with each other. You, you know, um, as two separate parties and whether or not we can function together. If you cannot agree that my eyes are not lying to me, how can I sit down at the table and trust that you can negotiate on something as complicated as tax reform, right? Um, so I think that is one factor we have to, to figure out um, as a nation and really as, um, as political leaders have to, have to figure out how do, we, how do we reverse that trend. The other, I think, is this disinformation, which is a huge factor in how we see the world, right? And it's just really, um, it's perpetuating this division in our nation and, you know, the forces are internal and they're external. And I think that is a major factor that we, we have to, I hope, um, I think Wes may look into it, but others, other, my other, um, and Elise, Elisa will too. I mean, you know, some other fellow, um, fellows look into this issue of disinformation and how it's really affecting our ability as a society to, to advance, um, to agree, to find commonality, to find common ground. So I think those are sort of two big factors that really require leadership um, from a national level, political level, from the newsrooms all the way to you know, um, my old boss's suite in the Capitol building, right? Like we all have to really get invested in addressing these two issues because they're just having this um, this um, negative sort of deteriorating effect on the nation and the health of the nation. Hey, Mo, Mo if I can yeah. add one uh, more point to that. Um, I don't know if this is the chicken or the egg, 
Um, but the manner in which people consume information now actually uh, compounds division in a really profound way. So just in the last couple of days, um, the media bias index came out. Now, again, I'm not owning or adopting anything in it because, you know, it's a private um, media watchdog, the Ad, Ad Fontes media that puts it out. But it's really fascinating looking at how they map out different media organizations. And again, not it, not accepting any of the findings in it, right? You know, whether CNN is actually more liberal than PBS or whatever. But the simple fact is one can live their entire existence only gathering information from, for instance, the Federalist Fox News uh, or the Dan Bongino show or uh, you know, Wonket or Salon.com or whatever on the other side. And you can, through Facebook or Twitter or whatever, self-select one's own media sources. Um, uh, and live your entire day like that, right? If those, if that is the manner in which you're consuming information, necessarily it's going to compound some of the issues that uh, uh, Kristen pointed out, which is demonizing other people uh, and so on. You know, Mo, you and I are roughly the same age. And, you know, in college, there was basically, you know, New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, and the three networks. We can debate whether the appropriateness of their coverage of any given issue, but at the end of the day, people were all consuming their information from the, or their news from the same general sources. And you didn't have the choice to only go to Twitter to hear your uncle's take on Joe Biden, and that's it. And um, when you when you think about that across every manner of your existence, um, necessarily people are going to end up more siloed. So again, no, chicken or egg, it, it, it could be the cause or the, it could be the cause or the result, but, but it's certainly not helping. I mean, it's such a fascinating point. And I'd love for Wesley and, and Daphne to weigh in on this. I mean, I was on TV, on Fox. I was doing a Fox hit the evening that the Mueller report came out. And so like I had all day to prepare, right? It's a big, thick report. And so I spent a, little, a couple of hours just trying to read as much of it as I could. Then I spent a couple of hours watching CNN and MSNBC to see how they covered it. And like at the end of watching that, I was convinced everyone in the White House was about to get like hauled out in handcuffs. And then I walked over to Fox and I'm sitting in the green room before my hit with all these other you know, conservatives who are sitting around and they're all high-fiving each other, screaming total exoneration. And it was as if I was living in, they were just living in two completely alternate universes. When the media is as polarizing and polarized as our politics. We'd love Wesley and Daphne for you guys to kind of weigh sure. in. Sure, um, I, can, I can start off. And I wanted to add something too, to, um, to Kristen's good overview that I think everyone else then touched on a little bit, which is one of the other things, in addition, I think, to the to the personal has just become um, the fact that one of the biggest sort of points of disagreement that is emerging now is just about what what is democracy? What is our democracy and what does it look like? And what are the values and um, what are the things that we uh, are all kind of fighting for? And I think that has been a real source of of conflict and growing conflict um, that all of us, I think, in our in our discussions are gonna are gonna touch on. Um, I would encourage people, and this is somebody who came out of out of uh, both network and cable, but had a background in very traditional media, exactly the kind of um, work that Elliot was talking about as somebody who worked, you know, as a foreign correspondent at the Associated Press and then at the Washington Post. Um, and then at NBC and MSNBC, that there is a world beyond um, cable news in terms of where you're going to get um, the perspective of a report like the Mueller report. And most framing, I think, is really important because that shows you um, both, you know, what that kind of analysis and opinion looks like in that in that fast moving sense. But I think if you gave everyone a beat to kind of read the report themselves or read uh, sort of traditional coverage, they would get a, a, a more grounded perspective. I think one of my um, sort of biggest things that I try to encourage people to do as, as, as media consumers um, is to have like a well-balanced diet. 
Uh, don't just stick to uh, one channel or one outlet. Um, if you really care about a topic, try to find all the different kinds of points of view. And I actually think if I could try to say something a little bit positive in this in this sphere is that there's actually more places than ever to get very interesting perspectives that um, traditional media also didn't didn't offer for many years. And being able to see stories through the eyes of different people, people who aren't like you, is easier now than I think it's ever been. Um, that's a positive for me and kind of the environment we're in. So I, I would add on to that, um, you, you know, I think it's really interesting. I think these questions are so important. And, and I would I would complicate the framing a little bit of how we're thinking about this. And then the reason I would say that is I think that very often when we attempt to grapple with questions of our current moment, we're best informed by looking backwards because almost everything we think is new is not new. Um, our country, like most countries, is just the same story on repeat over and over and over again. Um, and so we exist in a moment of political polarization within the press. Um, that is not an exception. That is, in fact, what the American press has been for the vast majority of its history. Uh, but for a long time, American press was the literal newspapers and you would have seven newspapers in the town. Three of them would be Republican, four of them would be Democrat. Maybe the communists would get one, perhaps the black people get a paper too, right? And so the idea of having explicitly partisan press is it has in fact been the vast majority of our American history. Um, and the idea of having a ostensibly objective or neutral press uh, was an invention of the post-war period. This wasn't a thing that existed um, until following World War I and World War II. Um, you had broadcast news, the CBS, the ABCs, the NBCs, who had a monopoly. There were, there were four television channels. They were the four channels. Um, that you, and, and so um, the newspapers, uh, which had been owned by individualized families, began going coming newspaper chains. And so now it was important for them to get as many readers as possible, not just the Republicans in the town or the Democrats. And so you saw, for economic purposes, a push towards a a more neutral or even-handed press. Uh, but what the American people showed through their, the spending of their dollars is that is not what they want. Uh, the moment the internet came and began disrupting uh, the press, the moment the cable news uh, was invented, what we saw was the economic model that was successful was not the CNN model, it was the Fox News model. It was not the, it was the Drudge Report model or the Huffington Post model. And seeing in this moment, that's really interesting is, is we're seeing what we now, when we look at all of the news outlets, we, we now see an explicitly partisan press that is in many ways the norm and the outside and what's outside of the norm is everyone else, be it the Times or the Post or what CBS might try to do on the evening news, right? And I think that as we think about these things, I think we have to grapple with what does and so what does that mean? And so in a world where perhaps some level of partisan press is inevitable, when it's what the people want when they when they vote with their wallets and their clicks, what does that say for how we have to think about how we reach people, how we tell stories? Um, you know, beyond that, I think that you know I've, this has been a fascinating conversation, and I would also note that I think as we've been discussing, even the concept of unity and division um, at times can be oversimplified in conversation. Some of the moments of greatest national unity have been the moments where we've done the collective worst things we've all ever done together. Um, I think millions of Iraqis would prefer us not have been so unified in 2003 in our decision to invade a country that had nothing to do with September 11th, right? Like there are any number of moments where we collectively have been unified and that has not always been an objectively good thing when we assess the moral and ethical decisions we have made as a, as a country. Um, and so I think that's a thing we think about as well. Um, although what Christian was saying, I think is so important that the polarization, the partisanship, that has always been there. And I think trying to drill into what is actually different and unique in this moment, and also what is the same as it's always been, helps us to differentiate. And therefore, hopefully, as I think we all do, helps us come up with potential answers. Um, I, I, I wanna continue the, the conversation on polarization for a quick second, because I think everything you guys are saying is absolutely right. Um, but I think, you know, we do tend to look at it through a purely political prism too often, right? Left versus right, D versus R. Um, and I actually think that it is so much deeper right now, right? And for a lot of the, a lot of the country, um, 
they would say, yeah, this isn't new, right? Like we've always been screwed, whether, you know, the you know, black community and in an urban community or people who live in rural Appalachia, you know, who feel like they've been overshadowed and ignored by the coastal elites, right? That, that there's social and cultural um, polarizations that we that are at the heart of all this. Um, and that our institutions are failing them, whether it's government and politics or the media or the legal system, right? Um, you know, the, you know, um, that people just aren't looking out for them. So I'm going to feel free to weave that sort of thought into some of your answers. Um, I'm going to bring on the next student, though, to ask their question. Maybe there's a way to address all of this. Uh, Joe, uh, tell us who you are, where you come from, your school and year, um, and then go ahead and ask your question. Hi guys, I'm Joe. Um, great to meet you guys. Looking forward um, to a fantastic semester. Um, I'm a freshman in the School of Foreign Service and I hail from the suburbs of the United States' greatest city, the city of brotherly love, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Um, and my question is um, to you guys, what, what do you think the greatest accomplishment or um, thing that the Biden-Harris administration has done so far? Because obviously they've had a lot of challenges, but what would you say the strongest point for the administration has been? Ashley, why don't you go first? I was like, I feel like I have to answer this as the person who just left the White House. <laughs> um, I think, you know, I think the greatest accomplishment was the speed at which we responded to, um, to COVID and to the immediate crises that the nation was facing. The passage of ARP was a huge infusion of capital into communities, into people's back pockets, you know, into um, building an infrastructure where people in rural America, urban America could get access to a vaccine that they didn't have before um, the president took over. So I think for me, that is probably, you know, someone who was stuck in her house for a whole year with the rest of the country. I think that was that was the sort of the biggest impact that the administration has had is the immediate infusion of capital and getting um, and creating some infrastructure around vaccinations. I mean, you have to remember before, Biden took over, there was there was no coordination. You had governors like Chris, you know, um, um, uh, I'm, now I'm, his name is escaping me, the governor from Maryland um, coming out basically saying there was no infrastructure, there was no coordination, the White House wasn't talking to them, they had no sense of how to respond, their counties weren't talking to the governors. It was just a, a colossal mess. And so for me, I would say that that's the biggest um, accomplishment to date. I think adding on to that, finally getting an infrastructure bill done. I mean, it's sort of been talked about in Washington for the 20 years I've been in Washington. Everybody has hoped to pass an infrastructure bill. So to finally pass an infrastructure bill, I think is a is a really big deal. So those would be sort of the two things I would say, um, even addressing the media crisis, fight crises facing the nation, and then finally getting an infrastructure bill done, which is really going to help sustain us over the next 10, 15, 20 years. Anyone else want to weigh in? Crickets. Tough. Joe Biden. No, I'll, I'll, give, I'll give credit to this. It may seem small, but um, I was in the White House, well, was first in the Department of Defense, then the White House during the height of COVID when we first were getting reports before it was even declared a pandemic. And then going over, I mean, we didn't have basic things. So like swabs and uh, reagents for antigen tests. So honestly, I'll give huge credit to the Biden administration. Yesterday, I went on the covidtest.gov site ordered my test. That was un that the idea of doing that was unbelievable to me one year ago. So, hey, I will take small victories. I've got plenty of criticisms, but that that is a huge step in the right direction. Um, we need more clear messaging on COVID, but there's no easy way to deal with a pandemic. So I, I give kudos to them for that. All right. Thanks. Um, uh, and thank you for the question. All right. We're getting close to the end. So I want to try to squeeze in a couple more. Um, let's go to Matthew next. Matthew, introduce yourself. My name is Matthew Henry. I'm a current master's and management student at the McDonough School of Business. My question is, is it advantageous for the next Republican presidential candidate to reintroduce Donald Trump's policies and rhetoric, or should they deviate from Trump and launch a new platform? 
Well, I've got thoughts, but don't want to monopolize. <laughs> I'll go real quick. I'm sure um, Kristen's got excellent thoughts on this. Great question. Um, it's my strong opinion that they, you can take some of Trump. I mean, he animated 70 million voters. Um, that's not something you can scoff at and look at some of the economic policies that I think uh, created what was a thriving economy until the time that COVID hit. Um, but there are aspects of it that have to be rejected. Um, there's a reason that we bled white, uh, we actually bled most major people groups. Let's say educate, college educated voters, we lost. We lost suburban women, we lost senior citizens. That That is a direct result of policies that weren't meeting people where they needed to be. So I think um, this that's a big question to bite off, but um, you could, I don't think you could run nationally and get elected again purely on what Donald Trump ran on in 2020. Um, that said, I think he'll be the nominee. Um, but I also think that you can't dismiss everything that he accomplished um, because that did animate a significant number of voters. So my take on this is that the Republican Party, if it's if the Republican Party is about Trump, if Trump is the core animating force, then that really limits the ability of the party to um, have any broader appeal. At the same time, if the party says we are not about Trump and we are actively disavowing him and we don't like him and we're making a clean break. The problem is that mathematically, he really did bring a lot of people into the political process who had been very disconnected from it previously, who are now a big and essential piece of the Republican base. So the question is, if the Republican Party gets caught in an are we uh, for or against Trump battle, then either way you go, you're losing a, a, an piece that's necessary for the party to have a majority. Can I say one thing as well? Um, if I read behind the question what I think is behind the question, it's not a question about Donald Trump's policies. It's a question about the rhetoric and the behavior. And I say this because a lot of the things, and this is uh, some of what Alyssa talked about, a lot of the policies put in place by Donald Trump would have been put in place by most mainstream Republicans. Case in Republican presidents, case in point, judicial nominations and the Supreme Court. You can't tell me that Kavanaugh and Amy Coney Barrett and Neil Gorsuch would not have been at the top of the nominations list of pretty much most Republicans um, were there to be three confirm uh, were there to be three vacancies at the time um, during during the you know what I mean during the, the course of the president's term. The idea that Trump was somehow an outlier. Um, on certainly that lasting legacy, I, I, I think uh, isn't entirely accurate. So maybe it's a question about ought the next Republican um, uh, nominee to replicate the bombast and the and the misbehavior and the misdeeds of, of, of former President Trump. And frankly, you know, I think there's a pretty clear answer on that. Uh, but that's for Republican primary voters to decide, number one, who they want to be their standard bearer, um, and number two, which direction they wish to go. All right, thanks for the question. We're gonna squeeze one more in, but never fear, if, you, if your question wasn't picked, you still get a chance to talk with them in the breakout rooms. We'll, we'll come back and, and talk about that. Um, apologies if I mispronounce your name, uh, Red Haya? Uh, it's Red Haya, but uh, you, can call me, you can call me Rad. Um, it's nice to meet you all. And Elliot, it's nice to see you again. Um, I worked, oh, I got the chance to interact with Elliot uh, during my time as an intern at Raven. Um, my question is, what is the best advice you would give to us young people who are getting involved in the political process for the first time? It's a great question. Who wants to take it first? Daphne, you want to kick us off? Sure. Um, advice um my advice is to, don't do anything that doesn't feel right uh tell the truth stick to your values and um and and be be really clear and honest um with the people that you are working for um and the team that you're working for and if you are working for a candidate as opposed to a party um really, really do everything you can to understand um, who that person is and, and what that person would do if successful um, for, for uh, their fellow citizens. 
Um, I, I think that going into politics, as, as Mo said, um, of all of us, of journalists too, is a great public service. I wish everyone um, would be hungry, hungry like you, if you're thinking um, for yourself, because it's an incredible experience in life. I just, I just, my advice is just to be completely true to yourself and and don't do things that don't feel right. Can I add one thing to that, and sort of adding to the first sentence uh, you said, Daphne, which is, and this is the advice I will give anybody who comes in to see me during office hours for the entire semester. So frankly, don't come into office hours because I'm gonna say the same thing. No, no, here. no, go to his office. <laughs> come to hours, office hours, but you can hear me echo this point, which is that regardless of whether you're a master's student or an undergrad, uh, there is an impulse to try to map out the next 20 years of your life based on the steps you take. How do I get Daphne Linzer's job? What are the four jobs I need to have between now and then? And it just doesn't work that way. And just to use my personal instance, the job that I think I held for the longest, I think my ICE job uh, was didn't exist when I was in law school. It literally did not exist because the Department of Homeland Security hadn't been created yet. You can only plan out your existence so much. And so like Daphne says, be honest, you know, be have integrity, um, do what feels good, um, and not what you think you end up with on the other side. Yeah, I think I would add to that. It's not it's not linear, and I think Ellie is absolutely right. I, I would say chase the challenge, not the title, not the money. For me, that's always put me in the center of all the action. When you're in the center of all the action, all the eyes are on you. When, no matter if you you win or you lose, everybody's focused on your work, and so that elevates your work. I would say the second is is to be an effective listener. That's always been like if you're especially if you serve in a in a role like a communications director or an advisor or um, a spokesperson, like being an effective listener is really um, the way you learn and put you in a position to collaborate more. You learn your principal, become mind meld with your principal. You start to outthink your principal, get ahead of your principal, re anticipate where your principal will be. And all of those things, I think you make you more successful in a political environment. All right. Um, for those fellows that didn't give an answer, they are ready to answer them in the breakout rooms or in their office hours or in their discussion groups. In a moment, we're gonna break from here and everyone's gonna to go to their breakout rooms. Before we do that, I wanna ask Emily, our uh, fantastic fellows co-chair to come back and just take a couple minutes to remind you all, all the different ways you can get involved with our fellows. And then when she's done, we break go to the breakout room. Each of these fellows are going to stay in their rooms for about 30 minutes or so. Um, and feel free to hop around. You've got all the links. Should also have been in the email and it will also be in the chats of the breakout rooms. Feel free to hop around. Um, if you're interested in applying for a student strategy team, which Emily's gonna to talk to you about, like this is a good chance to sort of kick the tires and get a look under the hood, see uh, how you feel about each of these fellows. Uh, they're here auditioning for you. So, um, so I hope you'll take the uh, advantage. Um, thanks to all the fellows for the conversation. Look forward to continuing it. Emily, bring us home. Thank you, Mo. Thank you all for such a great conversation. We are all really excited about the semester's class of fellows and really hope that you are too. Uh, we hope that you'll consider applying to be on a student strategy team where you can work alongside one of these fellows as they engage with Hoyas on campus. Uh, again, that application is found through emails on Geopolitics website and through links shared by their social media. Additionally, you can actually sign up for one-on-one -on -one office hours now and sign up for the fellows newsletter so you don't miss any news about their latest discussion groups, office hour times, and also any other additional events. So we hope you enjoyed this as much as you did. As you can see as a teaser, this is a phenomenal class of fellows. So please join the breakout room on the link. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. See you in the breakouts.